Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are so um, privileged here to have um, a viewing of such a wide array of work forming a very broad view of what sculpture is, what shape it may take, how it may be used, and how it seems unbound by any strictures. Um, there is some impulse to sculpture, from arranging stones to carving stone, from selecting form to creating form. The first thing I would like to do is um, start with a really basic question. And that is, if um, you could talk about, in turn, I'm afraid we have to pass a mic, but what drew you initially, going way back to your first um, decisions and feelings about sculpture, about the materials, what impulse um, pushed you forward in, in, in investigating um, three-dimensionality, um, object making, material itself? You want to start here? Let's see. I spent probably 20 years drawing on paper. I've never been a painter, but drawing on paper. Um, and it became clear after a while that the, the forms I was drawing were, could be made sculpturally. And I found a wonderful black wire that to me looked like a pencil line. And it came in different gauges. And so I started drawing with the wire. I didn't need the rectangle of the paper any longer. And this was probably about 16 years ago and I started making objects. And the first ones were super flat, just like drawing on paper. Um, and then they've gained a little bit of three-dimensionality, but that is a challenge for me. So it came from the impulse to draw. So I feel like I'm still drawing, just with different materials. Did I answer? Yes. <laughs> I think that's a really great question, Jan. Um, for me, I, I, one of the, the very first memories I ever had that I, or the, the memory that I can recall is um, the side of the, uh, the cinder block house that we lived in. And I must have been two years old. We lived in New Mexico and I remember the, the cinder block texture. And it's, 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 not a, it's not a beautiful color and it's not a beautiful texture and it's it's sort of ordinary but it's that always stuck in my mind and I would think about that I still think about it today on a regular basis we lived in uh, southeastern New Mexico and the the soil there is um, is mostly sand and it's really parched so I would see the um, uh, the way that the the, the soil would cur curl up after a rainstorm and be very fragile and I was really attracted to that, uh, to those textures. Um, and and the, the feel of the sting of sand during sandstorms, the sting of sand against my legs. So those are early memories, but as I got older, um, I gravitated toward drawing and painting, and that's what I was studying in college. And it wasn't until I was midway through college that I was forced against my will to take three-dimensional design and beginning sculpture as a part of my BFA requirements. And taking those classes changed my life, and I stopped doing painting and changed my major to, uh, to sculpture and, and pursued that. So I had sort of a circuitous route coming from really being invested in materials, but being a painter and then changing to sculpture. Uh, I always um, was interested in, in being an artist uh, from my very earliest memory, not knowing that you could actually do it as sort of a job. I just thought you did it at night in your basement or your garage or something like that. But um, so all art interested me. But uh, the thing about sculpture that I really liked was its tangibility and its relationship to the body, that one approaches sculpture or even an object like a water bottle and you kind of immediately go through these calculations. Is it bigger than me? Will it fall on me? Can I step on it? You know, 
you do all these things that's different when you look at two-dimensional work because two-dimensional work is more of an invented space where you use um, memory more than your actual body. So when I was young, I did all kinds of art but in, and even um, dug holes to get clay. I grew up in the Midwest, so you could reach clay after a certain size hole and would make um, sculpture. So I, uh, you know, I've always uh, liked to do everything. I loved photography, I love sculpture, I love drawing. So um, I can't say that I'm just wedded to sculpture. Um, gosh, I haven't talked about my work in public for several years, <laughs> so give me a chance to. Um, I just remember, I started out in photography. I, I don't naturally think things through by drawing. I, I take a lot of pictures. And I remember my pictures were getting bigger and bigger, so they were getting sort of physical, the production of them. And I was taking pictures of objects in the middle of the frame. And so I was trying to isolate interesting forms, and it dawned on me I was spending a lot of time in the dark room, in the dark when I really loved light, and I, I loved the gelatin silver prints and paper, but I, I was starting to look at art and seeing materials that were so interesting. And, looking at going to galleries and looking at sculpture and realizing, gosh, I just, I feel very, um, I feel sort of stuck here in the dark room. I'd like to try to move. So, so it became interesting to me to think of, well, how do I move from photography to sculpture? And um, some of the things I did first was to work with mirror, um, to learn how to make molds and reproduce things three-dimensionally. They, they all felt like positive, negative, extension of image kind of things. And I still think it's really, I think a lot about the relationship of photography to sculpture in my own work. That's all I can think of. It's really interesting hearing you guys talk about, um, about how you began, because I see, I see all the connections. Um, I started as a photographer, and I was doing these kind of um, ephemeral installations um, in abandoned spaces, and, um, and I found at some point, I was showing all these photographs and I was doing liquid emulsion, um, because I was really interested in the texture of it and the kind of coat, you know, you could see the, um, the brush strokes. Um, and so, at some point, I realized that what I was drawn to uh, weren't the end product of the photographs, but exploring the spaces themselves and that kind of um, like the sand, you know, beneath your feet or this kind of um, the smell of the must or um, or these kinds of very tactile experience of being in the space, the, the creaky floorboards that were just not quite safe enough to be walking on. Um, but that was really, uh, that was really how me moving into creating sculptural things. And it helped that I grew up on construction sites. My dad was a contractor, so I had a, my own little tool belt from the time I was three. So <laughs> it's kind of a natural progression. So. My, my grandfather had a cement mixing plant. <laughs> so I remember being on the site, building sites. It was really fun. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about how you think that prepared you, that kind of background or how you weren't prepared for the things you wanted to do. Because, um, you know, taking up um, some of these materials is quite challenging. Um, picking up, you know, pieces of steel and cutting them and, and all of that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your relationship to the materials you use. You want to start, Jan? Yeah. Because <laughs> well, I know you've got steel cables and steel I use, a, I use a lot of different materials, so unlike some artists that gravitate toward one type of process or, or uh, one type of material, I, I'm interested in all types of, of material, and I, I, I share the, uh, the connection that you have about loving all of these different ways of making art. Mm -hmm. It was kind of hard for me to decide in college what it was I wanted to do, but um, but then once I, I got the sculpture bug, I thought, oh my gosh, this is such a challenge. 
and it's so, uh, it's so difficult, and you can make art out of anything. And also, being a student, when you don't have, a, you don't have much income or no income, you, you start thinking about, well, what can I make art out of? And you realize that the world is full of stuff. And <laughs> stuff can be made into art. So you don't have to go to an art supply store. You can walk down the street and pick stuff up or go into the woods and gather things and assemble them or, or order things from the steel manufacturer <laughs> and have it delivered. But I, I love the challenge and, uh, and, and also what materials mean and the, uh, the metaphor of certain materials and, and how that can be imbued into the message of the, of the sculpture. You know, sculpture was just burst wide open, sort of, when was it, sort of the, in the 60s. And it was the process artists that I was most interested in. And the artist, uh, Eva Hesse, it was huge influence because prior to that, um, you know, when I was in school, sculpture was a male domain. And if you entered the room, uh, someone would run up to you and say, what do you want to do? You know, and they would want to do it for you because yes. you were a girl. <laughs> and, uh, and so I actually took more classes in craft because the teachers uh, were sort of the, in crafts were underdogs. So photography, metal smithing, ceramics, those were the areas where women could take classes and be left alone to do their work. And um, those gave me amazing skills. You know, I used lathes, I learned to weld, I learned to solder, I learned to, I learned to do all these different kinds of things. But well, running into Eva Hess, which I wasn't aware of until my first year at grad school, which is changed my mind completely. Like, there is no orthodoxy to, to sculpture. And that's what really attracted me, and that's what made me take off like a rocket in sculpture. Because you could take anything, you could do anything to it, and a big part of it was, what's the idea behind it? Not that you carved marble really great, or you did a really great weld, but it was like, what, what's behind this object? What's the idea behind it? So um, I can't even remember your question now, so I'm going to pass this. <laughs> um, I like that idea of it being about the concept, because I think more often than not, I think of my work as conceptual based, and the materials kind of are what they need to be. Um, and it is a giant puzzle. It's this kind of trying to figure out the angles of pitching a roof, or I was telling Jan the other day, I had, um, I built this 21 foot covered bridge and I pitched the angle and did all the woodwork and then I realized that the brackets I needed were like some bizarre angle, so I had to fabricate these super thick brackets and weld them and they were, it was just ridiculous. <laughs> but it was because I had pitched it myself and I had no idea what I was doing. So this idea of getting to explore different materials and, and problem solve is really, Kind of fun. Yeah. I, think, I think I like to think of about um, movement, material, and movement, and how how and how all materials, in some way, shape, or form, are related. Um, and then also about how um, you can capture a sense of movement, um, materials. I I started out being really intimidated about actually making something and then having it be in the world forever. Like, I think I was most worried about how I would feel about it. <laughs> a lot of times, I, especially as a young artist, I hate, hated the things I made, but I didn't throw them away, and now I love them. But I have this relationship over time with the things I make. I digress. Um, but so I went back to a practice when you say, women got to do things like cook and bake, and so that's what I learned how to do as a kid. Um, and so I, I made, m most of my early work in sculpture was made out of pastry and caramelized sugar, very short-term materials that were really fun to figure out how to work large scale with. 
had to solve a lot of engineering problems. And then I never really had to worry about storing anything. I just threw it out at the end of the show. I'm really interested in um, one aspect that I see throughout the work of all of these artists here, and that is um, really um, different pursuits, shifts in, um, in investigation. And um, I was wondering if you could talk about what stimulates and has stimulated those shifts for you in your work. I mean, there's a big difference even, Mary, between your, some of these pieces and mm -hmm. working with the stones. I mean, they're really big right. shifts. And I'm curious, like, with all of you, because you all have made really big changes in, in your direction and your investigations, what could you, could you identify as um, triggering those kinds of shifts? Well, originally, when I started making sculpture with wire, there were no natural materials in it. I had an ongoing and simultaneous collecting habit, and it's kind of out of control now. I had to get rid of my pickup truck because I just kept picking things up. <laughs> um, but um, I, I like to hike, I like to camp and take walks, urban walks, and I collect things all the time. And so those things have come into the sculpture in a kind of aha moment. Not everything has a natural element or a found element in it, but um, these two sort of paths I was on kind of came together when I started adding, I don't even remember what it was the first time, rose hips to a sculpture. So that happened because I had this collecting nature of myself. Uh, about myself. And so uh, sometimes I use them and sometimes I don't. Um, this larger piece in the back uh, came about because I had a whole collection of welding rods and I had a collection of rocks. And I started drilling the rocks. I got a drill press and started um, attaching objects to individual rocks. And then um, I dug out the old welding rods, and I wanted to see how gravity would affect different stones on the ends of the same length and type of rod. And that piece was born out of um, curiosity about gravity. Well, you know, one of the, one of the things that I, I was fascinated by when I was in college and I was shifting from, uh, from, from painting to sculpture, it's like I felt like I knew how to paint well and all of this, but with sculpture I felt like I could, I, I could imbue so much more meaning in the physicality of it and sound and performance and all of this. And, and I also realized that I was really greatly affected by whatever environment I was in. I was, a, I was an army brat, so I moved around you know, a crazy amount of times 22 times actually with my parents. Um, but I was in um, college in um, Alaska, in undergraduate school at University of Alaska. And I was really, really affected by the environmental forces there. And so I used a lot of natural elements in my work. And I think throughout my trajectory as a as a human being and as a maker of things, I just, whatever I make sort of parallels where I am in my life. So after I sort of late college and after college and early grad school, I was doing a lot of really angry woman stuff <laughs> and, you know, including performances and and um, and installations and things like that, but but um, but I always felt that there was sort of this vital connection between what I'm what I'm making as an artist and what my life is about or how I how I view life. And um, now I I see the shift toward kind of a more subtle approach with my work, which is kind of interesting as I'm as I'm getting older and not so angry. <laughs> Really, all my work is linked, even though many times people will say, oh, your work's so different now, and I'll be confused by that, because conceptually, I'm, I'm following the breadcrumbs, which is, what is it like to live in a culture that's capitalistic, based on capitalism, 
and where we always have to be getting new stuff to keep the system going and getting rid of old stuff. And, um, and I've just been following that along, you know, where um, when I ride in California, some of these works here were picking up the corrugated metal along the uh, country roads off outside of Sacramento and um, thinking about big agriculture and also being amazed by the horizon. I thought that was fake. I didn't, I had never lived in California before. I, I, and I didn't know that that was a thing. I thought it was just made up in books, you know, in illustrated books. Um, and then I moved to the thrift shop and then I moved to stores that just sold one type of used thing. And I just sort of been walking through and then uh, in 2009 when the housing crisis occurred, it was the houses people were in a way putting out on the curb. And so I couldn't actually do sculpture anymore. I had to switch to photography. So my work has been photography uh, ever since, which you know, in some ways is distressing because I like the physical working of sculpture. I mean, I just enjoy working. And uh, photography seems so, you know, in some ways easy. You know, you do a digital file, you hit print, um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's what the work has to be. So um, the work is based, is really determined by the idea. And yeah, I'll just fly over to you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. Um, golly, that's a kind of complicated question. I mean, I could look back and say, well, I did definitely have to make a shift when I wanted to stop working with pastry and start working with more traditional materials or more um, long-lasting materials. And I, I found, how do I approach these materials that other people have used and, and make them feel fresh? So I had a long period of muddling with that and thinking about how I just have to find my own very particular creative process. Because I know, even though I'm casting caramelized sugar, I'd really love to cast bronze one day. I'd really love to work with marble. I haven't gotten there yet. But um, so then I went through a period, I had a couple of kids and that certainly affected my work and I became much more of a studio based artist. Um, yeah, so uh, and that affected my life so much it's really hard to, to to distill it down to one thing, but I did start working with geometry a lot in that period and thinking of things that soothed me, <laughs> uh, like pattern and um, repetition of ge geometric forms. Um, yeah, I don't know, I can't. it's a hard, hard question. I think um, the, first, the first step in creating sculptural work started from moving from photography to creating a space in which people could experience the same kinds of things um, I was experiencing when photographing. So I, I did this, um, this room that had creaky floorboards that I had pulled up from a creek bed somewhere. And, um, and so it had torn wallpaper and all these kinds of different elements. I did sound and, and video. And um, the thing that came out of that was people would visit the space and talk about the smell and how it reminded them of something and this kind of connection to memory based on the smell and the texture of the boards and walking in that space. Um, and around the same time, I went to the ICA in San Jose and I saw a solo exhibition of Louis de Soto's and he had this incredible piece called The End of Desire and it was this plank that kind of um, went through the gallery and it was had all these cocoa beans lining both sides and it was the first time that I had experienced scent um, as part, like as an element in artwork, um, so seamlessly. I mean, a lot of there's a lot of kind of kitschy stuff with scent and things like that, and so that was why I, I did my grad at um, at San Francisco State. I was like, I have to study with this person. Um, so yeah, it was it kind of was a transition into me exploring multisensory um, ways of engaging with art and. Um, and creating spaces or sculptures that had elements that were, you know, somebody, a participant can touch or smell or duck to enter into. You have to engage your body physically to experience the artwork. 
So I wanted to open it up um, so that you could ask some questions and um, present some, some issues maybe to our artists. Really? <laughs> yes. Would you mind standing so everyone could hear you? I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I am interested in hearing people maybe pick one work that's in the show and say something specific about it. Um, there's been a little bit about the, the stones and the rods, and that was really interesting. Um, so that's my, that's my question. Thank you. Could people do that? What, what, yeah. what kind of thing are you most interested in? Like how Anything. it was made or mm -hmm. what it remains to? Biography of an artwork. How did you make it? Biography anything, of an artwork. Anything. So, I have the mic. Yeah. <laughs> I have this side this time. So I have one piece in the show, so I can talk about that piece. Um, it's a piece out in the courtyard. Uh, it's called Occultation. Um, and so the the word, um, it, it's generally for um, for celestial terms when any kind of solar body moves in front of another, so like an eclipse or something like that. And so I was thinking about how, um, how the present kind of occults our view of the past. Um, and I was working with Jan, um, commissioning, she, they commissioned, the Richmond Art Center commissioned the piece. Um, and so I was really looking at Richmond as, um, it has such a rich history. So going back from um, agricultural times, um, then there were, all kinds of you know agricultural silos and things like that um, in the area. Um, there's a huge industrial uh, with the Ford motor system. There's a, a huge connection to the naval history. And so all of the photographs inside the, the piece are historical archived photographs of Richmond. And um, so I was really interested in kind of exploring the, exploring the history of Richmond and, um, and this idea of, of me our memory, how we engage um, and the, the agricultural history is the silo. And I was in, in researching, um, I found this term um, silo, uh, content silo, and it's a way websites organize information based on keywords. So there are several different, um, different themes in the imagery. So um, some of them are connected to the naval history, some of them the industrial history, and so on. So yeah. So that was the idea of, um, as I mentioned, I'm very interested in participants engaging their bodies. So the black dots occult or block your vision of the image. And in order to see the entire image, you have to move your body around the black dot um, and kind of physically engage. So. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, I just asked her a question. She, she, just, <laughs> she totally threw me. Uh, I was going to talk about one piece, and Lucy just asked me to talk about a different one. So, sorry, that was. Can talk about two? <laughs> yes, I will. Yeah. Because actually, coming back to your point about shifts in in yes. one's work, yes. there's a shift documented pretty <laughs> dramatically in my work between two pieces, and one is the um, day glow orange geometric piece, which is perforated with tubes, um, and then the, the cast bronze figure of my daughter screaming Mamie and the, a little closer to us here. Uh, so I said that while I was, after, while my kids were small, I started working with geometry and I, I specifically took a block and perforated it. And then I decided to, to try to figure out how I could have that block mass produced or how I could mass produce it. And, and so I had it made several different ways and then I started building things out of the block and then I started taking pictures of the things that I built out of the block and then I started putting photographs of the pictures on the pieces. So that piece out there is a, another pattern piece from the same perforated block series. I told you this is complicated. But that piece there is made out of coroplast that was laser cut for me. And the, um, the, all of those ovals were laser cut. And then I, I had paper silk screened with a fluorescent ink and may, I made tubes that are inserted through the piece and then glued back. And um, I've shown it 
horizontal to the floor, so you can actually see more through it, and I've shown it up upright. I, I think after a period of working with this perforated block, I do think of it as like my perforated block period, I, 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 How do I say this? I, I, I guess what was missing, for, I, felt, I felt the work was becoming too formal and um, I, I needed another way in for another part of, of my life. Um, I wanted to bring, s not narrative, but Im imagery somehow in that had some meaning to me. So I started trying to work with photography and photographic image and what that meant to me and what it actually physically was and how I could bring it into the work and so I made um, that piece of my daughter screaming is a photograph that I took from a photograph I took of her in our kitchen when she was about two years old and um, I remember when I took it she reminded me so of myself when I was a child you know when I got frustrated and I still feel this way I just want to scream um, and she all, but her pose reminded every, everyone who saw the picture, I had it in my studio for years, would laugh at it and stop and look at it. And uh, I think it, the, the formality of her pose is very similar to Degas' Little Dancer. Mm -hmm. And I, I've had loaned, I had passed the blouse on to a friend who had a daughter and I called her up and said, quick, do you have it? So she, she gave it back to me and I remade it and to, to fit to the sculpture, um, the ruffle around the waist, the way her hair is pinned up, it was all sort of, but the kind of the opposite of the sweet dancer. Um, screaming Mamie, her name is Mamie, a lot of screaming Mimi's, or a bomb, <laughs> anyway. So I said earlier that sort of the overall arching sort of idea that um, is helpful to me, kind of like a roadmap, is this idea of living in a capitalistic society. But within, the work isn't just about, it isn't about that, you know, it just helps me, it's like a rule, it helps me decide, well, what's in and what's out. And uh, when I was in the thrift shop um, phase, um, you know, one of the things that thrift shops don't like is books, because they can't sell them. And so if I went to a thrift shop enough, suddenly if they noticed I was buying books and I was really interested in dictionaries and books of knowledge and stuff like that, they would come up and say, you know, you can take whatever you want for $5. And I'd say, as much as I want? And they'd, yeah, and so I'd load up my <laughs> giant station wagon. And, um, and then I'd look for patterns. And I, I've always done that when I worked with used consumer items, is looking for patterns. And at the time, I was reading a lot of Carol Gilligan. Did you ever read any of her? She's from Harvard. And she studied girls. And, and the question was, why are girls confident at 8? And at 13, 14, they lose all confidence. So at 8, they're going to be, I'm, at night, I'm going to be an astronaut. And during the day, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. And then when you interview them again as teenagers, they're like, I don't know. You know like, so it, her work was really interesting. And so this piece here, is done with a, a dictionary, and initially I started highlighting it with f f pink, you know, girls pink, just words that a girl would be interested in. And then I realized, no, like girls would be interested in like all the words, not just <laughs> certain words. And so that's when I just made a crude stencil and let it be really sloppy and stenciled over certain pages. And then on top I had the birds and, you know, um, I can't really tell you exactly why, but it needed something and this idea that the birds can sometimes be sitting on a limb and you could say to someone, go look at, look at that bird out there and then it's gone, you know, like a split second later. And I like that idea of fleetingness. So that's really what that piece is about. I'm going to add to that <laughs> because for me also the fabric that you've chosen is very veil-like. So for me it's very much like a veil. And I think there's a reason why when we watch um, Cinderella and the Disney version, it's birds who are dressing her with oh, all of those ribbons. I haven't seen that class. movie. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I pulled that into reading this piece. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I do remember lots of times when the, some Disney things would be birds the flying birds around. And, and, and also the talking to birds, that sensitivity of being able to communicate with animals. Like the first, one of the first is talking with birds, I think. 
St. Francis? It's, yeah, it, it, it's, all, it's always seemed like a skirt to me. Oh. So that's, that's kind of what I... Maybe because of Beverly Sims, maybe you're thinking right, of her. Right, right, yeah. large, flowing, right. Um, well, I have, I have um, three pieces in the show that are really linked, uh, and you might not be able to guess which ones they are. Uh, the first one is the piece of railroad track that's cut into hundreds of slivers that's hanging on the meat hook in the, in the middle of the room. And I, I made that one I, after I finished the Holocaust and Genocide Memorial at Sonoma State. So the, the Holocaust and Genocide Memorial took three years to, um, from, from the design phase and, and the permitting and getting all of that stuff done and the fundraising and meeting lots of community members and, and all of that. And so while I was working on that I, I, and finishing it up in the last two years, I thought, okay, I'm just going to, last year, I, I, I can't do anything else but this thing. I got to get this monument done or I'm going to be working on it for the rest of my life. So I, I just dedicated it myself to that, and I and I was really really keen to get on to working on some other sculpture. And as I was working on, I was thinking, okay, I've got this leftover railroad track, used railroad track, and uh, what would happen if I just cut it up into quarter inch slivers or little slivers, eighth inch slivers, and and see what happened. So uh, so that's what I did. I had a piece that was about four feet in length and I put it on my horizontal bandsaw and just for several weeks just cut the steel into slivers um, but I didn't end there I, I had to keep them in order of how I cut them so I'm just kind of maniacally obsessed in that way with the uh, materials and process and then drilled holes in each one and strung it together on a, on a cable and Around that time, uh, both Jan Worm and I were invited to a show that was about Marcel Duchamp. So I was working on this and I thought, okay, well, you know, I can see kind of a Duchampian thing in this uh, new descending a staircase. So, so I titled it, this is not a new descending a staircase and uh, hanging off of a, a, a meat hook that I initially borrowed from the uh, Slaughterhouse Gallery. And that one's one that I fabricated for the for the piece. Uh, made me think of victims of genocide and 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 slaughtered animals and and the the, the cruelty of of humanity in you know, the way that we interact with other people who are different than us and the way that we interact with with animals. So that that was also. A, felt like it very much of a spine piece. And prior to that, I did a, a work that was a 109 foot long uh, backbone in front of the Sonoma Community Center. It was made out of uh, two and a half acres of Chardonnay branches, of old growth Chardonnay bran branches. And I started thinking about all this work that I'm doing and it's kind of back breaking and I was really feeling it in my body. Uh, so I, I did that and then I did the 10 foot tall uh, spine that's right here to, uh, to Jan's right. And that is made out of uh, microprint paper, which I have some samples of if anyone wants to look at what the paper actually um, is, com uh, is comprised of. It's, it's imprinted with uh, microscopic text from all of the printed matter in the United States from the early part of, of, uh, of the formation of our country and condensed down into this, uh, into this format that can only be read under magnification. And at the time that this was made in the late 1960s and the uh, early 1970s, this was, this was very technologically advanced. But of course now it, it's sort of it's, it's, it's sort of arcane, uh, it's sort of archaic. So um, the library at Sonoma State was getting rid of this amount of material. The librarian phoned me up and said, do you want this stuff? And I was like, yes, I want this stuff. I don't know what it is. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But after sitting on it for a few years, then I came up with this 
a spine. I thought, I want to do a, I want to do a spine, and it's got to be 10 feet tall, and it's, it's carved paper. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what it is, and it's got all of this embedded information inside of it. Oh, there are three holes drilled drilled through it. So I um, took boxes of these, about two and a half inches, and I cut, I rough cut the shape out on my on my bandsaw after I drilled the, the three sets of holes, and uh, and then I put it on one stainless steel pipe and two rods, and then carved it. So it took a year to to carve this. Uh, it's not glued together. It's just stacked, and then in the um, in the, the final sanding process, the, the coating on the outside of the paper transfers to the outside of the, of the carved paper and gives it a natural coating. It's, yeah, it's the friction. I think it's always dangerous to become friends with librarians. That's why I have boxes of old slides in my studio <laughs> that are waiting for something. You know? It'll yeah, come to lots you. Lots of books, yeah. You had a third piece. Oh, the third piece is the, the third piece that's related is the uh, the spikes. So, like a lot of things, the railroad track given to me by Union Pacific for the uh, for the memorial, uh, the paper given to me by the librarian at Sonoma State. When when the guy came to uh, to deliver the railroad tracks, he also brought a bucket of of spikes. And he said, well, hey, lady, do you want, you want some spikes? And I was like, oh, of course. How could I say no to a bucket of spikes? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't know me yet. So, <laughs> so uh, the, the, the ironic thing about the, uh, the spikes is that spike, the, these giant railroad spikes are meant to hold down a very significant chunk of metal onto the, onto the ground. Um, but here, they're just holding on to each other uh, with rare earth magnets. So they're, they're just uh, clinging to each other with rare earth magnets. And then they can be rearranged in whatever way that suits the space. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, I'm gonna tell a little more of the story of this, the tall piece with the stones and the steel rods. And that is that I collected the stones over many years walking in riverbeds. Um, I just seem to have an eye for the rounded ones. Um, those are the ones that interest me. Almost all of these came from the Sierras, various trips up in the mountains. And at certain altitudes, depending on the geological formation, the stones have traveled long enough downstream that they're rounded or oval. So I know I have my favorite spots that I go to to gather stones. At that time, I was just discovering them, but now, now I know where to go back to get more. Um, and after making this piece, I've added to it. It was, it was less uh, stones in number, and so it's accumulated over the years, but this is probably its max. Um, and w when I've presented it in the past, it's been uh, presented in many ways. It's been in a grid. It's also been in a, band, a line very high up on the wall, two lines. Um, it's been crisscrossing in a corner. Um, but the surprising thing that happened was when it was presented up high as two rows of steel rods, uh, a musician saw it and he brought his cello in and played the shadows of the stones on the wall as musical notes. And um, I also, I don't encourage anyone to do this, but I have tapped the stones and they will bob for a really long time. So if I actually had it seriously anchored into something, it could become more kinetic. Um, it's a thought I've had about it in the future. Question? <laughs> well, that's because you have wood behind your drywall. <laughs> that's, I have installed it into just a drywall wall, and it's very tricky because the larger stones, once 
uh, you insert them straight in and you like let very gently let them down and if you're not gentle about it they can tear through the drywall so the wood is what stabilizes that in the back yes yeah. uh, Well, I certainly feel an urgency to make all the pieces in my head. And I don't know if there's time for all that. Um, I don't feel any loss of creativity. Um, I feel pretty energetic, uh, and, I, and I will just keep going. I have certain, I've injured my back in the past, so I have certain limitations. I can't make gigantic, big, heavy stuff, but I make modular things and I make small sculptures and pieces made, works made of many pieces. So I just plan to continue at least working in that way. The subject matter changes over time, but there's plenty of subject matter to be interested in and to work about. So uh, yeah, I feel an urgency to keep going. <laughs> Yeah, I, I echo that. Yeah, <laughs> at this point in my life, I'm looking for. I say, okay, how how long am I going to live? So how you know, maybe 40 more years? I don't know if I live 40 more years, you know, or I could die tomorrow. Um, so that's that's a really good question uh, because I also have a lot of things going on in my studio and using different materials and so forth and it seems that there's never enough time to make the stuff that I, I want to make but oddly enough and, and please don't hold this against me I have this really strong urge to go back to painting <laughs> oh, you have to leave now <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to do but um, um, maybe maybe I'll start painting again so but I'll have to keep it secret because I haven't painted for you, yeah, for but, several decades, so it, it it might be really bad. But 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 what what's drawing you to that? I mean, what's the the pull? I love the activity. I love the activity of working on large canvases and the and I think that's the physicality thing too. So maybe when I get back into doing some large-scale sculptures that I'm working up now, um, that'll be satisfied and I'll sort of lose my interest in painting again. But I hope not. I, I, kind of, I, I don't see why we have to just do one thing. No? Yeah. Don't have to. And then I get more gear in my studio. Yeah. <laughs> you spend more money on art supplies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, artists don't retire. They just drop dead sometime, you know. But I mean, when have you heard of an artist retiring? Like, you know, in a reading an art magazine, so and so just retired, right? Uh, it's what's his name? That that Italian artist keeps that one right, Italian he, he artist keeps saying. Yeah. Um, Maurizio, uh, Maurizio, Maurizio, Maurizio. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Lee Bontecu did not stop making art. Well, just she just stopped. Out of the art world. She just dropped out of the art That's world. Right. Um, and Duchamp pretended that he did. Yeah, he but didn't, he didn't stop he either. Did, really, yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's really the answer. But I'll tell you, there's, there's the one problem I think a lot of sculptors have is anxiety over storage. Yes. And, and that's, that's one of my big anxieties, too, is like I have three storage spaces. And, you know, every time you make something, you realize, um, it's probably going to end up in storage, right? <laughs> so, um, it's, uh, not that many artists that sell everything they do. So, that's the issue, and that's where the, the heartache comes in. Yeah, I think you have to be very strategic. Um, I mean, I do hope that I have some large pieces left in me, but uh, physically, I don't have the energy that I had 20 years ago, um, or the strength. Uh, but I'm working all the time, and 
I mean, although I go through periods where I think, why, why am I doing this, and what difference does it make? I, I, I oh. guess doubt is part of faith. But um, especially as the world takes the turns that it's taking, um, I think, you know, I'm going to keep working because it's what keeps me sane. Uh, I kind of didn't get the question, didn't quite understand the question, but okay. I do plan to keep working. I have no idea what I'll be making in 20 years. It was like we're getting older. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I heard I that part. <laughs> I don't think you're included. You're not as being older, but... Yeah. but I, she so, was excluded from Yeah, that. I'm excluded Problem. from this part, but um, it, talking about space as a... I mean, this is something that I've run up against. Where do you put a 21-foot covered bridge, you know? Um, but there is... Michael McMillan, there was this interview, and he was talking about um, about his pieces and how large, and it was... It was um, they were going around his, his property, and it was just so full of things. And he said, yeah, so I started doing video art. <laughs> it's like his solution, so. Yeah. But Michael also repurposed parts. So, um, I mean, everything was there and things were taken apart and there were sections and they sort of like came together in new formations and things like that. And he also produced a lot of small wall hanging pieces that could go in the gallery and be sold too. I mean, he, he worked back and forth between what he was doing. I'm talking about him in the past tense. I don't know why <laughs> he has. But um, yeah, that, that's kind of amazing to have to deal with all of that. Um, but I, I think um, it, it's really interesting, the, um, the gestation of these works that you've talked about, and, and, and it's been very insightful. Um, has there been a gestational period which um, seemed difficult or where something external had to come in and find a, a solution for you, where something was resolved through um, some external, uh, something you saw, something you read, something you experienced that came in and brought you out and brought some work to fruition? No. No. <laughs> Oh, I, I think that happens all the time because I, I, I'm a real big believer in keeping a, um, a sculpture sketchbook and I, 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 I militantly enforce this with my students and you know, some, some of them adhere to it and others don't because for me, things like, you know, like what am I going to do with this paper um, will have to sit and gestate for a long time before I find just the right thing because I think when when you're making sculpture it is I think there's there's so you're sort of ethically bound to what am I going to bring into the world right that doesn't already exist because there's already so much stuff in the world so what am I going to bring into the world that uh, that is meaningful in any kind of a way to you know first to myself and then hopefully to a, a, a broader audience uh, and and a lot of times I'll have an idea I'll have a head on something and I just can't I can't get any traction in the studio with it because it, it, it seems there seems to be an unresolved part so I often at times find myself just in a conversation with someone reading something uh, seeing a film or uh, just having a walk and suddenly it, I'll I, it, it'll it'll come to me what the solution is. But that's a solution to an already started sculpture or artwork, and that's the process that we all go through. You know, my understanding of your question was like, do you ever get like stuck and well, can't go forward with your work? That you have some idea, it might be vague about something, yeah. and it doesn't. It, it's before it's fully formed, and that. Um, but this is, this is something I talk to the students all the time. I don't need that. Oh. Um, well, that, we want it on the video, though. OK, all right. That you, you start with a vague idea. You don't know if it's any good. It often is really bad, actually. And it's not till you're working on it that you start seeing the potential of the idea. And that you just have to have a certain kind of leap of faith to begin. And then during it, you can't batter yourself when it's really awful because you will eventually work your way through it 
or it will become trash and you throw it out. One of those two things. And the things that help the work are like you see a movie, you talk to a friend, you're reading something. Often for me, I'm leaving the studio grumpy because the work is so bad. And I'll look over my shoulder and I'll be like, all of a sudden, I understand what the piece needs. And, um, but that's the creative process. That's everybody does that. It's not unique to me. Travel, I find, helps me a lot. Just sort of very simplistic answer. Um, I find I'll just keep, I'm, I'm just going to the studio every day and keep at it, at it, at it. And when I travel, I come back with such a clean slate. I can see things so much more clearly. And also, I like having people to the studio because I, I think that maybe what happens when I'm in the studio is I'm having a conversation with myself every day. And, you know, it's hard to go someplace interesting and new with yourself every day. And um, while I'm in the studio with somebody else, I'll s suddenly see a problem or a relationship I hadn't seen before just because I'm having a different conversation. Mm -hmm. just, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, not a good answer. I think wine helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think sometimes explaining what you're doing to somebody else, that kind of somebody else looking at your work and you having a conversation and having to talk through it. I mean, this piece was gonna be totally different. <laughs> and yeah. over time it evolved, the first step you know, wasn't working and you have to stay open and you have to, you have to have faith in the fact that you've done this before and you know what you're doing and it's gonna, it's gonna come together. And, or like you said, it doesn't. <laughs> There's always that fear, but um, yeah. Well, yeah, the conversation thing in the studio, what's weird to me is that it'll be something across the room that we're not necessarily, we're not talking about. Mm -hmm. I'll just see differently. Like my vision and how it comes into my brain has been altered because I'm having this different type of experience in a very in my studio. I, don't know. I had a very different kind of experience, which is I lost three members of my immediate family in about five years, and I couldn't work in the studio. And the studio has always been a place of solace for me. And um, that went on for a little while, a couple of months, really frustration, frustration, and I realized I just needed to grieve. and. In a couple of months, you know, I gave myself two or three months or whatever it would take. You know, I found myself wanting to get back in the studio and really wanting to work. And I don't know if it really changed my work, but it changed, um, a, gave me a more of a feeling of urgency about working. And it really was this, my salvation. I'm not a religious person, but boy, the studio practice helps keep me sane. and having confidence in, that I can return to it during fallow periods is, you know, helps my psyche. So you just have to keep the faith. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of these artists who've been incredibly open and sharing. Um, this has been a very, um, very special talk um, today, very special afternoon. I, I can't remember. Um, art being talked about so personally and so open um, with all the sort of um, warts as well as the, the glory and shine. And I want to say thank you. We have a beautiful catalog that documents every single piece of work in this show. I hope that you'll take a look at it and maybe take one home with you. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming this afternoon. We also have a group of artists from the other exhibition, Mapping the Uncharted, who will be here next week. So I'm so glad that you're here. If this is the first time you've come to the Richmond Art Center, I hope you will come again and come often. Consider becoming a member. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Dan. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.